And I couldn't, I couldn't help but notice our bulletin. And on the front of our bulletin, it says, Ecclesiastes 3.1, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. If you were here last week, you will remember that it was so hot in the sanctuary. And so we tried to overcompensate this week. And so now everybody's going to be cold this week. And so this bulletin couldn't be more true this morning. Um, but we are glad that you're here. And we just want to welcome you this morning. And um, we hope that you would just... Uh, Worship in such a way that it warms you up. And that's our desire, is that you would worship in such a way that it's pleasing to our Heavenly Father. And that is our heartbeat around here, is this isn't something we do just because it's Sunday and so we come to church, but, but it's an opportunity for us to just be full and overflow of what God has done for us. And so that is our desire as we've come into his presence is that we would worship him. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to pray a prayer of blessing on today's service that he would just use this service in a mighty way to exalt him in a way that we give him our very best. Let's thank him. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege that we have to come into your presence each and every week. Lord, I'm blown away at how good you are. And so, Lord, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for opportunities that you use us. I'm thankful for opportunities that we, we can't see you using us, but you are. Lord, I'm thankful for those moments because they teach us so many incredible things. Lord, I'm thankful for your protection, your strength, and your provision. Lord, may we worship you in a way that you are well pleased today. And may we walk away with you, a smile on your face, because you are well pleased with us. I thank you and I love you. In your name I pray. Amen. And let's stand together this morning. Worship him. His grace is enough. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Come in. Are we happy this morning? Are we happy? Okay. As we come and we worship Him this morning, as we lift up our voices, our hearts to Him this morning, we're looking at this morning in the worship time and, and, and looking at the sacrifice that, that Jesus put on the cross. As Jesus was on the cross and, and, and He gave the ultimate sacrifice, as the Lord gave His Son up for us, this morning that is something that we're able to worship. Amen. That He gave His Son for us. That He gave... Listen, I love you guys so much. I love each one of you. But if I had a son, I probably wouldn't give him for you, okay? I'm just telling you the truth. And I know that you guys feel the same. But the thing is, is that he loved us so much that he gave his son for us. This morning as we worship, that is worthy of us singing. That is worthy of us shouting. So as we come and worship him this morning, let's lift up our voices. Lift up our hearts to him for the sake of us. an opportunity to talk on the phone with a drill sergeant from the United States Army. 
And man, these guys are intense, okay? I'm intense about stuff, but these guys are almost over the top intense. Um, and, and I got to talking about just a little bit about boot camp. And that's to tell me, tell me a little bit about boot camp. What is your role in boot camp? <laughs> and um, very nonchalant with, um, very nonchalant way, he said, my job in boot camp is to tear young men down in order that somebody else can build them up. He said, my job is to take someone in that maybe has an ego or maybe has an attitude in and bring that down a few notches. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, a lot of different ways. And I proceeded to talk with him a little bit more. And he told me that it is a process of learning that will ultimately create protection in the future. Now, it got me thinking about the character of Elijah a little bit. You see, because last week we began a study on the, on the character of Elijah. And, and in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, in verse 1, he goes before Ahab, like we learned last week. And he looks at Ahab, this wicked, evil king, and says, It won't rain until I say so. And we found last week that Elijah was a man with a nature like you and I. And so you think after that, after that moment, that was a moment that you go into the streets and say, I am the man. I am Elijah. I have just walked into the throne room of Ahab. And I said, it's not going to rain until I say so. And I'm going to tell everybody about it. But then verse 2 hits. And verse 2 through 7 is really out of place to me. Because when I think Elijah... I think of a couple different things. I think of a chariot that takes Elijah up to be with heaven. That's one of the things that I think of when I think Elijah. I think this guy got in a chariot and went up to heaven. That's an incredible experience. Then I also think Mount Carmel, right, where he, where he brings down fire. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, so I don't want to get into that a whole lot. But if we were to interview Elijah, if he were to come here and he were to be in service with us and I were to ask him probably what was one of the most influential moments in your life, he would say verses 2 through 7 of 1 Kings chapter 17. I believe it with my heart. Because this was a moment where God broke his will, if you would. You see, because I believe he was probably pretty high-spirited after verse 1. He has just walked into the throne room and he says, listen, I believe that my God won't let it rain until I say so. It would have been easy for Elijah to say, I am the man. I am the man. But in verse 2, we get a clear picture of God's direction. It says this, And the word of the Lord came to him. Verse 3, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. Let me stop right there. This is, this is an interesting spot for verse 3. The Lord doesn't say, now go and tell the entire community that you've said it's not going to rain. So that the Lord ultimately will be lifted up. And so that your word will be true and that it will be testimony across the land of how good God is. That's what I expect verse 3 to say. And, and Elijah went out into the city and proclaimed that it won't rain until his God says so. I would say, absolutely, that's the Elijah that we've come to love. But the Lord tells him to go and hide, to run. Now, the, excuse my reference here, but that's what chickens do. They run and hide. Elijah has just walked into the throne room of Ahab and says, it won't rain until I say so. So I expect him to, to, to walk out with boldness and proclaim it to the entire town that says, my God is good. And it would be a testimony for the entire town to know how good God is. But God's direction was different. You see, because Elijah needed, needed this training to happen. I think there's a couple reasons why the Lord asked him to run and to hide. One was for his home protection. You see, he had just walked into the throne room of one of the most evil kings even historically that we know of. And I believe the Lord said, I've got to keep you under a bushel for a little bit. So this king doesn't find out who you are and where you are 
because I'm going to need you a little bit down the road. And so I, I need you to be around for a little bit. But also, I think he needed a little training still. He needed a little boot camp. He needed a little bit more preparation. You see, because verse 1 is interesting. It says that Elijah, the, the Tishbite, in verse 24, it says, Elijah, the man of God. There was a transition that happens here in his name. You see, in verse 1, he's just the Tishbite. In verse 24, he's the man of God. There was something that happened, and I believe it happened between verses 2 and verse 7. That's when this happened. Pick up with me, if you will, in verse 4. And you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and he did accordingly to the word of the Lord. He went and he lived by the brook Cherith. And that is the east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I, I thank you for this time of training. I thank you for this time of provision. I thank you for, for moments where our brooks dry up and we say, Lord, I'm not sure what's going on here. I'm thankful for moments of provision and training in my life. May we recognize them as moments where you are molding us into exactly what you want for us. I thank you and I love you in your name I pray. Amen. First, I want us to look at the place that God ordained. This place called Cherith. It, it, it was called to be cut off. The word Cherith means to be cut off or to be removed from. You see, the Lord took him from the throne room of Ahab and, and cut him off to get him away. You see, there are moments in our lives I believe that the Lord wants us to get away and hide in order that he may have close, intimate contact with us. I read just this week that I think that it is so true in the element of the church. He said the church has substituted service for intimacy with God. My fear of that is we've failed to recognize the significance of getting away and letting God mold us and create in us exactly what he wants for us. You see, that's what's going to happen here. In the next few verses, God says, I want you to go to a place that you're going to be cut off. You're going to be removed. You're going to be out of the spotlight for a little while. You're going to be out of the realm of ministry for a little while because I'm still working on you, Elijah. You're not ready to be the man that I, I want you to be yet. And so I'm going to create a place for you to go. And yes, God created a specific place for him to go. He names it by name. And not only does he do that, but he creates a provision for Elijah. Now, think about how incredible this is. Elijah goes to this place, and there's this brook there. And I can just imagine this beautiful brook, and it goes straight through this area of land. And, and he's able to go there, and I could just picture him. He gets to that brook, and, and he starts off. And notice that he lived there. This was not a camping trip. This was not a weekend getaway. This was not just an opportunity for him to, to take a little time off and go to this land. He packed up and moved to this land that God showed him. That is very important. We can miss it if we think that this was just a short amount of time. This would have been probably the amount of time between three and a half years that he lived there. And so he goes to this place that God showed him. Now, I could just picture him how incredible the provision of God is at times in our lives. When we're cut off, when we were removed from the distractions, we're removed from even ministry. Elijah, what he was doing was incredible. He had courage. He had, he, 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 he had confidence in his God. And he walked in and he said, it's not going to rain until I say so because my God is good. Throw out your idols because my God is good. And God says, I want you to go away and I want you to hide. I want you out of the spotlight for a while. You see, I believe with my heart, my heart of hearts is that there's some of us that need to be removed from the spotlight for a while so that God can form an intimate molding relationship within us. That's what he does with Elijah here. I can't picture this scene because I just can't picture this bird, this raven. The, the, I, Elijah wakes up in the morning and he must have thought, this is the life. I wake up and these ravens bring meat and bread and I go to the brook and I throw water up in the air and, and I drink and it's just an amazing, this is like the Hilton here. This is better than the Holiday Inn Express right here. I have ravens that bring me food, my food every single day. Tough life, right? 
I mean, we must think that I can't even picture this scene, these birds flying in. Here's your dinner. Like, I don't know if they talked to them, if they just dropped it, or if, if like, they had this plate, a paper plate, I'm sure, because we don't want to wash dishes. But I, I, I'm positive that there, were, there had to be something that, that this was a moment for Elijah that he says, man, my God is good. Listen, when God moves us, when he ordains us, and when he prepares us to go to a place or to do a ministry, he creates a provision that takes care of us. What I love about this is God calls him to a specific place. Yes, I believe that God calls us to specific places, specific ministries, specific duties, and he has prepared for us a place for us to do his will. He did for Jonah, and by the way, he had prepared Jonah, he prepared Nineveh to do some incredible things and have a revival that the entire city came to believe in God. And he prepared Elijah and he prepared these ravens. He says, I want you to go there, that specific place. I believe there are places, specific places, that when you are in those places, that is the will of God for your life. That is it for you. And, And there isn't a right place for you anywhere else. And you know something? I believe this with my whole heart. I believe Elijah would have starved to death. You say, why? Because there was a famine that he caused. I believe he he would have probably perished if he hadn't gone to the place that the Lord had told him to go. But nevertheless, there was a place that was ordained for him, this nature. What was this place about? This place was for him to hide. This place was for him to be alone. This place was for him to have that intimacy, that, that relationship with God that he longed for, that God longed to have so he could mold him and create in him something spectacular, the man of God, verse 24, that he had ordained him to be. This place was significant. Sometimes, sometimes we limit the places because uh, we were talking about this a little bit in Sunday school, and I warned my class that, that this was a preview to this morning's message. And so... I want you to understand something that God has a place for you. He does. He has a place for you to serve, to be involved. I believe he has a specific place for you. You say, well, how do, how do I know that? Because you have to inquire to know that. You have to inquire him. David inquired with the Lord in 2 Samuel. And God answered him. In Psalm it says, the word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. When we begin to inquire him, he gives us his word to direct us and guide us to exactly where he wants us to be. And amen to that, that there's a God that's directing us, that we can inquire after. There is a specific place for us, and there was a specific place that God ordained for Elijah. Not only was there a place, but there was a plan that God ordered. He says, listen, I want you to get, to get idle, and, I, and I'm going to protect you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send these birds. Now, imagine you explaining this plan to your friends. Uh, this would have been an interesting plan for Elijah just to tell his buddy about. All right, look, I'm going to this place. There's going to be this brook there. Uh, he's Ravens are going to come in and bring me meat and bread in the morning and evenings. I'd have been like, Elijah, son, what has gotten into you? You're talking about birds bringing you food. You're talking about this flowing brook in the middle of a drought where there's no rain. And by the way, thanks for that. (laughs) You pray for that. If I'm his friend, I'm, I'm seriously doubting these plans. I believe there's times in our life where we doubt the provisions of our God. You see, because when God calls us to a specific place, he prepares a way that we can have the providence and the provision of God to prepare us for that. I'm so thankful for that, that God doesn't just say, go to that place, you're on your own. Good luck, hope you can hunt. Oh, this guy had it made. He he wakes up, (laughs) red, (laughs) wow, cool. Big Mac. I don't know what this looked like, but I can just picture these birds coming in and feeding him, right? I certainly hope it wasn't like a baby bird, like where he, you know, the beaks and all that. That would have been dramatic, I'm sure. But, but nevertheless, what an incredible experience. What an incredible story for Elijah to tell in the midst of this. What an incredible plan by God. His plans don't make sense, by the way. To, to go to this, this place. Okay, I've just walked into the throne room of Ahab. What are the followers of God going to think? That I made this bold prediction and then I hide? 
This is never going to work. You know what my plan would be if I walked into Ahab's throne room and said, it's not going to rain until I say so. You know what I do? I go tell all my buddies. That's right. I told him. Yeah, I told him. I told him it wasn't going to rain until I said. He ain't going to do nothing about it either. You know why? Because I serve God. That's how I would be. Some of you are like, yeah, that's really how you would probably be. I think about this, and I think about just a command to go hide. And listen, this wasn't just God expects spiritual chickens out of us. I believe that this was an opportunity, a training ground, a boot camp, if you will, for him to to experience something incredible. You say, that is pretty incredible. Raven's feeding him. Not that. We're not there yet. This plan was incredible. But it was God's plan. And when his plans come into action, there is provisions for you and I. We look at characters throughout Scripture and and people like Moses, right? What was Moses' problem? He says, I can't really speak that good. Uh, I told my class this morning, I've thought over and over again, what it must have been like if Moses had said, you know what, Lord? You've called me to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. I don't speak well, but you know what? I know that your provisions will take care of me, therefore I will do it. Is that story different? You know what I think? Yes, yes. You know what I think? Moses probably experiences the promised land. That's what I think. If he walks with boldness and says, I'm a little nervous about this. Joshua, we look at Joshua and say, man, he was strong and courageous. Was he before he asked for it? Because if we really look at that story, he prayed and asked for that. Why? Because he probably wasn't very strong and courageous until then. We look at characters in Scripture, and, and these were moments for them that God had plans for them, and God created provisions for them in order that they could do exactly what God called them to do. And he does the same for you and I. He hasn't changed. It's the same God that when God calls us to do something, we say, well, I don't really know if I can do that. He will prepare you. He is God. God. That means when you step out and you say, you know what? I I don't know if I can teach fourth and fifth graders. I I don't know if I can do that. He will prepare you. He will prepare you to do that. There's a plan in place for us. But there was a problem, I believe, that God orchestrated. You say, what? Oh, yes. Because verse 7 tells us something very interesting. Uh, Elijah is living it up. He wakes up. Oh, yes, breakfast. Goes to the brook, gets him a drink. Everybody else, it's dried up because this prophet comes in and he says, it's not going to rain until I say so. But I thought about verse 7 a lot this week. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. You know what I thought about all week? Just picture Elijah day in and day out watching that brook. You know something? Brooks don't just dry up. You don't go to bed and all of a sudden, oh man, my brook dried up last night. I could see him day in and day out watching that brook going, brook's a little lower today. I could see him saying, man, the water sure is low. I've been here a while. I could picture him saying, there's water left in that brook. I could picture him looking at it and saying, oh man, what am I going to do? Before long, I could just picture this area that was a brook kind of be wet sand. And him looking almost in panic. Going, now What? am I going to do? Watching that wet sand turn into dry rock. Day after day, beginning to wonder, the word of God tells us that after a while, I believe he watched that brook for a while and he watched it. He watched it day in and day out and he saw it dry up. I've thought about verse seven all week. There are moments that I believe God orchestrates. 
fry brooks. Same in example. Abraham, the peak, the absolute peak of his spiritual life. God has promised him Isaac. God delivers. Everything seems to be going great. And what does God do? Abraham, I want you to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice to me. Dry brook. That is a dry brook. If I've ever seen a dry brook, that is a dry brook. What? Paul, in the, in the height of his ministry, in the height of, of, of him doing evangelism and writing churches, he's in Lystra, of all places, and they stone him and leave him for dead. Dry brook. Dry brook. I, I begin to think about Jesus a little bit. In the garden of Gethsemane, that was dry brook. That was looking, saying, God, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what's going on here, but I'm going to trust you. Church, I want us to understand something. Dry brooks are going to come. When we serve him, dry brooks come. For Elijah, man, I, I could just picture him living it up. Oh, my God is good. And we have those moments, church, where God blesses us and all is good. But when the brook dries up, how do we respond? I think there's a couple lessons here from the dry brook. One, the very God that gave you water can take away that water. Now, I want us to understand something very clear because I think the church, this isn't a message that we're hearing very much. But God gives us a spouse. If God chooses, God can take away that spouse. You say, wow, this isn't very popular preaching. That's really not. Excellent decision for Pastor Appreciation Sunday. God allows you to thrive in your business, and all of a sudden, uh, our economy tanks. Where is God? A dry brook season. A dry brook. You see, I believe it's in times of our dry brook seasons is that the Lord is able to mold us and to create in us and to take us from Elijah the Tishbite to Elijah the man of God. I believe it's in dry brook seasons that God has taken me at times from, from Stephen, the son of Randy Jackson, to Stephen, a man of God. But let me tell you something. Dry brook seasons are scary. They are scary. And we have to understand that the very God that gave you a brook to drink out of can dry that brook up if he chooses to. Because he is still God. And it's our responsibility to say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you and I will follow you. And, and I don't know where tomorrow leads, but I will trust you. I, I don't know where I'm going to get water tomorrow. I know and I believe with my whole heart that he wakes up and he sees the brook dry. And I believe Elijah said, Lord, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but I will trust you. I will trust you. And I believe he was scared to death. And listen, it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be scared in dry brook seasons. It's okay to be scared when the water isn't there. It's okay. That's normal. It wouldn't have been normal for a lot of people. Like, oh, good. The brook's dry. Who cares? That wouldn't have been normal. It's okay for us to be scared when God puts us in a dry brook season. But understand, he is still God. He is still God, whether there's water flowing in the brook or whether it's dry as a bone. He is still God, and we will trust him. He is still God. So the same, the same God that gave us water can take away that water. But you know what? A dry brook season doesn't necessarily mean that God isn't pleased with us. You know, it would have been easy for Elijah to say, I go into Ahab's throne room. I say, it's not going to rain. And, and man, I'm bold. I'm courageous. I do everything I'm supposed to do, and I do it right. And now he's hidden me out here. And now everything seems to be going great and grand. He got these ravens coming in. I have this nice brook, and I'm throwing water up every day. And now this brook is dry, and I've done everything I'm supposed to do, and it's just not fair. And I would say, fair. <laughs> wasn't displeased with Elijah. God was 
preparing him. And what you're going to find out is uh, sometimes we get to trust in the brook a whole lot more than we do God. We begin to rely on other things and say, well, the brook has taken care of me so far. And sometimes God has to show us that it's God that brings the water, not the brook. Sometimes, man, that's easy to get confused. It's easy to say, well, man, I'm relying on this brook because there's no rain anywhere. God wasn't displeased with Elijah. God was answering his prayer. I think sometimes we miss that. We have missed the fact that it would have been easy for Elijah to get discouraged and say, oh, no water, I'm just going to die out here. I believe sometimes the Lord takes us to dry brook seasons to prepare us for the next step. You see, that's what he was doing in the life of Elijah. He is preparing him to go on and do bigger and better things. And, and what I think, and man, I believe this with my whole heart, is that Elijah could have gotten very comfortable with the ravens just bringing him food every day and just hanging out in the shade tree, laying out by the brook, swimming a little bit. This is like the perfect summer vacation right now. And it would be easy for us to get comfortable by the brook. And sometimes I believe that God dries up the brook to prepare us for the next stage of our ministry. See, we look at dry brook sometimes and say, God... God has abandoned us. Where is God in this? God is very much in that. He's very much in drying up the brook. The church, it is easy for us to look at dry brook seasons and say, God has just abandoned us. It's easy to look at situations and circumstances in our lives. And when God dries up the brook, for us to, to not take that as a learning opportunity, but to take that as a give up opportunity. And to say, well, Tried this God thing. I went in and I asked for it not to rain and it didn't. Now I don't even have any water to drink. What gets lost in this story sometimes is the reality of it. The reality of it is the incredible impact of his prayer life. Did you get what's happening here? He is resulting. This is a classic picture of what we do sometimes. We pray, God, give me this. And then we get it and we're like, oh man, what was I thinking? Uh, when I prayed and not be rain, I, I meant you just still give me a little patch every now and then. See, I'm a firm believer, man, that God uses dry brook seasons to teach us, to mold us, to create in us an opportunity to minister. That's what he was doing in the life of Elijah. This was not a vacation. This was a boot camp. This was a training ground. I got to thinking this week. It was my mom's birthday this week, and she celebrated her birthday. And I got to thinking about when I learned to drive. Uh, I never liked for dad to teach me to drive because there was so much pressure, man. I was already nervous. Yeah, my palms will be all sweaty. I'm, uh, I'll be driving. You know, I can't hardly turn because my hands are so sweaty. And I got a dad that points out every single car that's on the road, every curb, every mailbox, every potential hazard. That's dad. Mom just kind of, mom, it was like an opportunity for her to put on her makeup. That, that's what it became. Oh, good. Steven can drive. I can just sit here and brush my teeth and it, it, it's crazy. Like dad, he'd be like, son, are you sure that seatbelt's tight enough? Mine's not, you know? <laughs> and my mom, she's like putting makeup, you know, she's not even paying attention. And I, and I thought about just the frustration at dad at times. Like, oh, dad, just let me drive. Just be like mom, you know. Gosh, you don't even watch. And that's probably still why I'm not good with directions because my mom's like, yeah, just turn up here. It'd be good. You know, I'm like, mom, <laughs> this isn't, this is the middle of a field, you know. <laughs> but I, I remember getting so frustrated with dad. But you know what? Dad probably taught me to drive. 
And it was in that frustration that I probably learned the basics of, you know, using turn signals and not following too close and really not following too close. <laughs> um, it's frustrating in Drybrook seasons. And you wonder, I'm not sure why this is happening. I remember going, Dad, I'm not sure why you're on my back so much. Why? Because he didn't want me to kill myself in a vehicle. One of the reasons we have dry brook seasons is because the Lord is preparing you. He's preparing you. He's molding you. They're tough. You see, when you're experiencing all of God's provisions, when the ravens are, are dropping quarter pounders and, and you have this brook that is just flowing, and I can just picture this perfect brook. But day after day, watching that brook, watching it get lower and lower until eventually it was gone. He had the tendency to say, where is God in this? And God was molding him into the man of God that he wanted. This morning, I, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're in the middle of a dry brook season and you're saying, God, where are you? Where are you? The brook is drying up. Maybe you're watching the brook dry up. Day after day, you're going, brook's a little lower. Brook's a little more. It's, it's, it's drying up. The back of your mind, this, this anxiety that, that, oh, man, what am I going to do? Maybe that's you this morning. You're going, I know exactly how Elijah felt because that's how I feel. Maybe there's some of us that need to be in preparation that we say, Lord, you teach me something incredible during my dry brook season. You created me to be the man and woman of God that you want me to be. Because we're going to have dry brook seasons. God is going to mold you He's going to create in you. And you know something, man? Maybe there needs to be some of us that says, Lord, it's time that I take a step back. I, I've been in the throne room of Ahab. Prepare me for something new. Hide me. Cut me off. And create an intimacy like never before. You know something? You say, intimacy, I, I didn't get that in that passage. Uh, when he woke up and noticed that the brook was dry, there was some intimacy that happened. I guarantee it. You say, well, the Bible doesn't tell us that. Well, let me tell you what common sense tells me. That when the brook completely dries up that God has given me, I say, God, where's the water? It's okay to ask where's the water. But you trust him. You trust him because your God is going to prepare you for something incredible. What happens next in the life of Elijah, get ready for it. Because as I mentioned earlier, this guy Elijah, he got put in a chariot and went up to heaven. That doesn't happen, I believe, without the dry brook season. It doesn't happen if he doesn't go to chariot. Maybe you're in the middle of Cherith right now and you say, man, it is not everything it's cracked up to be. You trust him. And he will prepare you to do something incredible. Let's stand for prayer. Father, I have been in the dry brook season at times and it is not fun scary. I, I can't say that I've been stoned and left for dead like Paul. I'm so thankful. 
But I can say there's been times in my life where I woke up and I saw the brook. And I said, Lord, the brook's not near as full as it was. Lord, I'm a little nervous. Lord, I'm a little scared. Lord, may when our brooks dry up, may we trust you. May we be men and women that say, you know what? Regardless of what the brook does, my God brought me here, and so therefore he will deliver me. He's got ravens bringing me food. Lord, may we acknowledge that in the midst of our dry brook seasons, Sometimes it's our own prayers that put us there. Lord, increase my courage. And when we're faced with adversity, we say, oh, where is God? Lord, increase my patience and you give me a 17-month-old. Lord, may we reflect on you answering our prayers instead of the dry brook. Lord, may you mold us where our testimony will be, I'm not Stephen, son of Randy Jackson, but I am Stephen, the son of the living God. That's who I am. Make us that mold us that and if it hurts and if we're scared so what we will trust you so bring on the dry brooks what a crazy thing to pray but it's in the dry brooks we gain intimacy with you here in just a moment I'm going to ask Josh if he would just to lead us in a chorus man and I, what better day to say Lord I'm in the middle of a dry brook and you've reminded me uh, fresh and anew to trust you. Lord, I'm seeing the brook and it's drying up. But I will trust you. Lord, I, I don't understand why I can't just face Ahab right now and eliminate him. I'm hiding. This is silly. May we trust you standing between us and food now, right? Okay. Uh, with it being Pastor Appreciation Sunday, we as a church come together and we want to honor uh, our pastors. So at this time, I'm going to ask Stephen and Nikki and Josh and Hillary to come up here if they would, please. You know, and, and Josh hit it right. There's a lot of things that, that you see Stephen doing that you don't see. Uh, you know, I, 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 we've been through a lot with our family, with my mother. And at times, I'll send out a prayer request on text message. Next thing I know, Stephen's standing at the hospital. And he doesn't have to do that. I'm asking for prayers, but he shows up and prays with us, and I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, Josh is involved with the youth. And, and I get to benefit of that with my son as well. And there's a lot of things he does with our youth that you don't see. So these guys and their families work a lot behind the scenes, and, and I appreciate them for that. So we want to take time to honor them. Uh, as a church family, we've got them a card here, and there's a gift card in each of them for each of you. And I guess at this time, we're the only ones standing between the food. So I'd like to ask the blessing and dismiss us and pray over the food. And before anybody goes down, we want these guys to go down first. So give them time to get out before we go down. That We want them to be first in line. So at this time, I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, please. Father God, as we close out this service on this special Sunday with Pastor Appreciation Day, we want to... Thank you for the families we've had here with Stephen 
and Josh, Nikki and Hillary, Lord, I, I, I thank you for what they've done for us and what they mean to us. Lord, I pray that you'll just give them a blessed day and a blessed week as October is celebrated for Pastor Appreciation Month. They do more for this church than anybody will ever realize. I thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you mean to us. Now, Lord, as, as we dismiss here and go downstairs, I pray, Lord, that you'll bless the food that's downstairs. Bless the hands that's prepared it, Lord. Give each one of us a great blessing today. Forgive us for we failed these so many times, Lord. We have these things in Christ's name. Amen.